uh, to your pastor, Elder Samuel Thomas. Thank you, choir, for the wonderful music. I stood in this pulpit at the age of 27 in 1969 when my father-in-law was your pastor. I'm now 74. It's been a while. Your pastor asked me was there anything I particularly wanted to be said in the introduction? And I told him just two things. One, I'm married to a wonderful woman. And two, I've been at this for 52 years. Next month, she and I will celebrate 50 years of marriage. You find a good one, you keep them. Somebody ought to say amen. I thank the Lord for our ministry together. Now everyone who has come before me took their time. Did you see anybody rushing when they were up here? <laughs> Nobody rushed. I ain't gonna rush. You got something to do, tiptoe on out. I got a whole sermon, I'm gonna preach the whole sermon. Is that all right? This afternoon, I'm going to deal with an unusual aspect of the book of Revelation found in the 12th chapter. There was a section of Revelation 12 that's especially for children. And anybody who's got a child needs to be back this afternoon. There was a portion of scripture in Revelation 12. That's for parents, Elder. And it's a passage of scripture that has affected every child that's ever been born. But that's this afternoon, when you had planned to be sleeping. <laughs> Try to get yourself together and come on back at six. Would you do that? Well, give it a try. Give it a try. Let's pray, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Amen. Amen. Revelation, the 12th chapter. Both sermons come out of Revelation, the 12th chapter. And I'm spending in my church, we've been preaching out of Revelation all year. And we're just about halfway finished. In fact, one of the sermons I'm going to preach for you, you actually get to hear before my congregation does, so you're special. Amen. Revelation, the 12th chapter. Now, when you're reading the Bible, come on, come on, wake up, wake up, wake up. You're reading the Bible. You need to learn to pay attention to the words. Don't just go skating through. Listen to the words. Vera, it's good to see you. This is my campus mother. I got old wood. Listen to the words. Why that word? Now watch. And war broke out in heaven. Now, the phrase itself ought to blow your mind. 
Because you're singing all these songs about peace in heaven. Come on now, peace in the valley. You know you sung it. Tree of life, golden streets, and gates of pearl, and angels singing. You know, but I just read, and you sat there so calmly, but I read it. And there was more there. Come on, somebody. That's not what you're expecting, war, is it? But I just read it. So immediately your attention ought to be captivated. The brother sitting at the keyboard ought to be now on his tiptoes. Why? He ought to be asking. And the drummer ought to be saying, did you hear that? Why is there war in heaven? I guess I have to be upset by myself. Then it says, then it says, it identifies the participants in the war. I'm truly shocked now. Michael, that's the heavenly name for Jesus. Jesus fighting. Well, I'm not particularly shocked by that. Because I don't know about you. But Jesus fights my battles every day. Come on, somebody. Yes, sir. But he's fighting in heaven, and, and he's fighting with angels. Now, once again, I'm pleased and happy because my Bible tells me in Matthew 18, 10, that every child born has an angel assigned to them by God. Is that all right? And now I know i got a fighting angel by my side. Y'all too come for me. Hallelujah, Jesus. So it's not that who is fighting, Jesus and angels. I want them to be war ready because this place I live in needs somebody who's tough and rough. You walk around Detroit, you need somebody beside you that can take care of business. You know I'm telling the truth. So I'm all right with angels fighting. Peaceful with Jesus fighting, but Brother Penny, my problem is they're fighting up there. <laughs> Did you read it? Oh. Then the Bible, as it so subtly does, builds the drama. Who are they fighting? Here it is. And the. And the. Talk to me, church. And the. Dragon fault. Now I'm I'm mystified. Who in the world is the dragon? Well, the Bible does its own explaining. Look on down there. Look on down there. It's right there. Ah, oh, verse nine. So the great dragon was cast out. In case I don't know who he is, the Bible calls him every name it can think of. The serpent, the devil, the Satan. Now I know who it is. Yeah. And so, brother Penny, I have my antagonist. And I'm not surprised at the devil fighting, because I don't know about you, he fights me every day. So again, I have to stress, it's not who's fighting, it's not that they're fighting, it's where they're fighting. They're fighting where I'm hoping to go. I want to get out of Detroit and D.C., there's enough fighting down here. And other when I get up yonder, I don't want any fighting. Can I get a witness in this place? But that's where they're fighting. I'm trying to get you upset with me. You're still way too calm for me. Here it is. Ah, verse 8. I love biblical drama. Verse 8. Look at it. Look at it. But they, who's the they? Who's the they? The dragon. And his angels got their heads whipped. Give God glory. Come on now. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Elder, the right folks won. Now, you know, we'd be in bad shape if that other fella had won. He's a destroyer. How do you know that the devil's a destroyer? He will break you in two if he can. And before this sermon is over, I'm going to tell you how he fights. But he, he fought. He got whipped. Now, verse 9, ah, verse 9, so the dragon was cast out. Wow. 
Where? <laughs> where? I want to know where that rascal is. Do you want to know where he is? Mm-hmm. I got news for you. So the dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives what? Oh, Lord. He was cast out where? He's here. He's here. I have just read to you the scriptural introduction to the great controversy. What did I say? What did I say? Great controversy. What did I say? Great controversy. There is a war going on in the universe between Michael and his angels and the devil and his angels and the war is over this earth. Now you understand why you catch hell every day. Was that too blunt for you? I'll be nice. Now you understand why it's a little rough every day. <laughs> but for those of us who are realists, we know we catch hell every day. So I say amen here. Now we know why it's messed up down here. Why? There are angels yes. fighting yes. over your pastor, over your children, over your marriage, over your job, at your house every day. And you sitting there all calm, coming to church, think you're just going to have a church service. The devil fought you all this week. Some of you sitting here should not be sitting here right now. That lady whose car turned over? God, by his grace and power, beat the devil again so she could come to church. Give God praise. This thing is serious, huh? Yes, it's serious. He's here. Somebody say, he's here. He's here. He's here. Yeah. Now, as I studied Revelation, I came to understand that this battle took place eons ago. Long time ago. He came here. Genesis 3. Genesis 3 announces his arrival. <laughs> Genesis 3, Lord have mercy. He got kicked out. We know he's here. In fact, in fact, go back to Revelation 12. Look at Genesis 3 in a minute. Let me show you something I missed. Revelation 12. The Bible has a way of kind of rubbing it in. Then I heard a loud voice. Verse 10, Revelation 12 saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren to accuse them before our God day and night has been cast down. He's here. Then verse 12 kind of upsets me. It, it upsets me. Because it says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell on them, I am in here. The Bible is saying, happy, happy, happy up there. <laughs> but the next phrase says, but more to the earth. Yeah. I'm saying, what's with the singing up there? We catching it down here. I just had to include that. Genesis 3. Genesis 3. So up there, he's out. But he's here. Yeah. He's here, y'all. Yeah. His arrival is announced in Genesis 3. Oh, my Lord. Now the serpent. Remember what he was called in, Genesis, in Revelation 12? Yeah. Now the serpent was more subtle. Yeah. Than in a beast of the field was the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden? And the woman said, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die.
And the servant said, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know on the day ye eat thereof, and ye shall be wise, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree, verse 6, the woman saw the tree that it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and a tree by the sand of desire to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, <laughs> and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed them fig leaves together, <laughs> made themselves aprons. And you know, that's a picture. That's a picture, y'all. You know, aprons only cover the front. Come on, y'all, stay awake. And Adam was about 12 feet tall. The scientists figured that he weighed the same as an elephant, about a ton. And Eve was about 10 feet tall, a little bit shorter. And she was a petite, maybe 1,200 pounds. You think you got weight problems, you ain't got no weight problems. And these two big people stay with the pastor. These two people have covered themselves with what? Aprons. Aprons made out of what? <laughs> now the, listen, the Bible is describing the effects of the war. Because what the war does is to strip you of your dignity, strip you of your manhood, strip you of your womanhood, strip you of your, your, your image of godliness, and leave you covered with the excuses of fig leaves. Are you listening to the pastor? Now the war is here, Elder Thomas. The war is here. The great controversy is here. It came here. It arrived at the Garden of Eden. We've been at war ever since. Look, 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 look. Genesis 3. I'm still reading. Jesus comes down. Where are you? Well, I hid myself. Because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? Adam, who told you you were naked? He does this. Because Eve is hiding behind a bush. Woman, who you gave me? Where did the war just go? Come on, folks, stay awake. Where did the war just go? Into the home. Because now Eve was to take an old-fashioned skillet and beat him on the head. He has thrown her under the bus. He's blamed the whole mess on her. And now the war is not in heaven. It's in your heaven. I'm preaching on the great controversy. I'm letting you know how this thing got in your house. Because what happened, Satan, the master deceiver, he brings the war into your mind, your heart, your home, your hopes, your dream. We are all victims of the great controversy. That's why you lose your temper. That's why you sometimes experience distrust. That's why anger sometimes fills your heart. Because the great controversy has moved from the portals of glory. Now lives in your living room, in your bedroom. The war is here. You can't escape it. It's deeper than that. Paul paints it, Pastor, in Romans 7, does he not? He says, the war is inside of me. He says, the things I say I'm not going to do, I find myself doing. Have you read that passage? And the things I say I will do, I find myself doing. He says, therefore, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. He said, the war is more than your living room, more than your bedroom. The war is in your head. Your mind is at war with your mind. 
I'm not going to lie, but I lie. I'm not going to lose my temper, but I do. I'm not going to the club, but I'm there. I'm not going to drink, but the glass is in my hand. The war has now come inside my head. The great controversy. And so that passage, my dear sister, in Revelation 12, is a serious passage. Yeah. Because somebody sitting in this church right now had more in their head. Do I keep my mind on the sermon or do I watch that lady that I want to get with? Do I pay attention to Pastor Wright or I just soon sit here and be mad at that lady who offended me in the church at the last board meeting? We cannot escape the war. It's all around us. And the only reason why we have any hope is because when the war started, the Bible told me that the devil did not prevail. I wish somebody would put their hands together. I already know he can be defeated. If he got kicked out of heaven, then maybe he can get kicked out of me. The Garden of Eden was built by God and its construction is described in Genesis 2. I'm moving now to the second phase of my sermon. Genesis 2, beautiful place, Verse 9, Genesis 2, And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight, good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now, look at verse 10. Are you with me? Everybody still with me? Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it departed and became four river heads. Name of the first is Pison. We have no idea where that is. It is the one that skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedidium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. That's the Nile. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. That's Africa. The Nile is in Africa. Are you standing with me? See, sometimes I preach and sometimes I teach. I'm now teaching. The name of the third river is Hiddekel. That's the Tigris. Look it up in any dictionary. That's the Tigris. And the last one is called the Euphrates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the only one that still maintains the same name. And all these rivers are in the Middle East. Where are they? The war came to the Middle East. Now this is very interesting to me. So I'm, I'm a historian. Because as I've studied my Bible, it appears that every important thing that God ever did to save mankind happens in the Middle East. So I like your response. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I like that. Now, when the Lord decided to destroy the whole world, wipe them out, remember that? Killed every living thing except for eight people and some animals. All that biological material decomposed and settled somewhere. Go to the dictionary and read the definition of oil. It is decomposed biological material. Where is most of the oil found today? They're listening, Thomas. These folks are listening to this poor preacher in the Middle East. 
and the nations of the world fight for control of the remains of our ancestors. Those are the bodies of the antediluvians of the great animals destroyed by God. They are focused in the Middle East. So therefore, even modern man focuses on the Middle East. Yeah. See, not only did the war come here, yeah. but it came to a specific place here, and you're going to see before I'm done, that the Lord has made the Middle East the stage for salvation. And the dumbest person in the world is a Seventh-day Adventist who has the knowledge of prophecy that we should have and doesn't pay attention to the Middle East. If it happens in the Middle East, God is talking. God is calling. God is tapping us on the shoulder. After the flood, the Lord raised up a family. It's the family of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Yes, come on, God. Come on. Come on. According to Revelation, according to Genesis 16, and by the way, if you want to really learn to study the Bible, learn to study Genesis with Revelation. Abraham had two sons. One he should have had, and one he shouldn't have had. Don't look at anybody, just say amen. amen. Keep your eyes straight forward. And the one he shouldn't have had was Ishmael. And the one he should have had was Isaac. Remember that? Let me read you something interesting in Genesis 16. Remember, Ishmael should have never been born. Because he was, some drama took place in Abraham's house. Because the woman that he had the child with he shouldn't have had, and the woman he had the child with he should have had, couldn't get along. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> In the meantime, the one who had the child he shouldn't have had, that child begins to grow up. And, and Abraham's wife that he should have had, with the child that he should have had, got mad at the woman that he had the child with he shouldn't have had, with the woman he shouldn't have had. Are y'all listening to me? <laughs> I tell you, you're watching days of our lives. Just read the Bible. It don't get no better than this. So, <laughs> the shouldn't have leaves. And her son almost dies, and the Lord says to her, talking about her son, this is, this is Hagar and, 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 and Ishmael, and, and she thinks that Ishmael's going to die. The Lord said, no, 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 no. Verse 11, Genesis 16. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son. You should call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. He will dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Later on down the line, Isaac has two sons, Esau and Esau is also a wild man. And marries Ishmael's daughter. Come on, God. Mm. And so now you have the the Isaac Jacob line. Is anybody listening? Yes. And the Ishmael Esau line. And the Ishmael Esau line become the Arabs. I love this book. And the, and the Isaac Jacob line become the Jews. Where do they live? You don't say. <laughs> and every time those two brothers can't get along, the United States and Russia and all the rest of us come running. It's like the Lord. Sis, 
They ain't never going to. I love this lady sitting here. They ain't never going to get along because God already said that the errors would be against everybody else. And the Lord uses that tension in the Middle East to hold the attention of the world because his son was born there. And the Bible tells me in Zechariah that when Jesus comes back, he's going to land on the Mount of Olives and put his foot there. And so the Lord has to keep our minds in the Middle East because that's where he started it. It's where he's going to finish it. You ought to be praising God right now. So the stage, Brother Sanders, the stage, Brother Penny, the main stage, the spotlights of the church ought to be on the stage called the Middle East. And every time that coup that took place in Turkey yesterday, every time that falling down of Iran, that breaking apart of Syria, every time the war in Afghanistan, every time the lot. The, 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 the ark landed in Ararat in Turkey, the Middle East. Every time something happens in the Middle East, God is saying, hey, Seventh-day Adventists, hey, Christian, are you paying attention? He that shall come will come and will not tell. Part three of the sermon, then I'm done. This war, what kind of a war is it, really? Well, I'll go back to Revelation 12, please. Are you with me so far? How am I doing? It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Oh, my. Let's get now to the good part. Let's get to the good part. Revelation 12. Yeah, here we go. Now, first of all, let's, let's review. Let's review. The war took place. Remember that? Where did the war take place? We're still shocked. I want you to be shocked now. I want you to go home shocked, surprised. I want you to tell your folks at work, you know where the first war was? And your, your co-workers are going to say, where? You're going to say, in heaven. They're going to say, where'd you get that? From the Bible. Then you have a good conversation. Let them talk about the Detroit this and Detroit that. Okay, all right. So, 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 here we are. The war in heaven. And then the war came where? Where on the earth? Garden of Eden. Where's the Garden of Eden? Oh, this, I love your church, man. These folk listen to sermons. And then we've learned that every crucial thing that God ever did to save you, honey, he did in the Middle East. Abraham's family. Ishmael's family. The ark landed there. Jesus showed up there and lived for 33 years in the Middle East. And then we read the text over there in Zechariah. didn't read it to you, but I told you where it was. Where in Zechariah, uh, where, 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 where in 14, where, where, verses 3 and 4, where it says, he going to land in the Middle East. So we now know the Middle East is the main spot. Are you with me? But his war, what kind of war? All right, Revelation 12. Finish it up, Henry, finish it up. Okay, I will, Lord. So the great dragon, verse 9, verse 9, balcony, verse 9, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who? 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 Deceives. Deceives. He deceived. That's his weapon, brother. He makes a fool out of us. See, you worried about death and accidents and, and tornadoes and, 
and various kinds of physical wars and the Satan is coming in your back door called the TV your back door called video games your back door called pornography somebody say amen out of this church coming in your back door making an absolute fool out of you in your head his method is deception Eve if you eat this fruit you'll be like God well she already was I read Genesis 126 and God said let us make man in our image after our likeness he makes you go after what you already have in Jesus he makes you think you can get it some other place And so, young lady, you have the image of God, you have the self-esteem of heaven, but you let some Negro make you think that if you spread yourself and you wind up with a baby by him, that's going to give you some status. You and he are not wise. Oh, this pastor is just too blunt and straight. Folk, I'm 74. I ain't got time for foolishness. <laughs> Because every sermon I preach now may be my last sermon. I don't tell it like it is. You listen to those sweet words and you buy into that garbage and make yourself think you can receive from a man or a woman that that already God has given you. He made you like him. You're his child. You're a son of the king. You don't need to act a fool to be somebody. You already are somebody. Don't need to drink and smoke and carouse and tear yourself apart. You got status. If you go, if you don't have status in God, you don't have status anywhere. Because human status is fleeting. One day they cheer for you, one day they boo you. One day they praise you, one day they talk about you. One day they made you head deaconess, next year they vote you out. You can't count on people. Stand under the umbrella of God. Believe in his support believe in his majesty his approval if god approves of me i don't care what you think he's a deceiver well lord knows i gotta pay my rent this month and so i'm not gonna return my tithe god understands he understands that you have no faith no courage and no gumption Come to church, yeah. take that rent money, yeah. put it on the tithe on but lick it, lick the tithe on it so it's sealed. <laughs> lick that boy, put the tithe in there, put that thing in the plate, and say, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Don't worry about it. Watch God bring rent up on a place you didn't think rent would be. Yeah. They could bring food. I remember my father kneeling down in our house. Groceries were short. Praying for God to provide for him, his wife, and four sons. While dad's praying, we hear steps go up to the porch. Dad keeps on praying, we hear steps leave the porch and then you leave the driveway. Dad gets done, walks to the porch. It's full of bags of groceries. Don't tell me what God can do. I've been there, brother. I didn't know. He deceives you. He makes you think that God isn't what God says he is. He makes you question the God that you serve. He makes you think that you can get what God gives freely by selling yourself. So he deceives. So Genesis 3, he deceives. 2 Thessalonians 2, he deceives. He deceives. His method is deception. How did you do this week? 
to get fooled, to get tricked. You know, one of the things he does, he he makes you make instant excuses for yourself. If you're driving down freeway, Interstate 96, and somebody cuts in front of you. Now, you know I'm in the pulpit, so confession is good for the soul. <laughs> don't cut in front of me. Brother Penny, don't cut in front of me. Keep your car on that side, me and this, don't cut. I just, I have to vent a little bit. Don't cut, Elder, don't cut in front of me. That tests my soul. I don't know why that gets to be a witness, but don't cut in front of me. Go by me, wave at me, don't cut. And you, this deception. And so he tells you in that moment, it's okay. Go on and speed up. Get upon him. And then he has you justified. You're going to teach him a lesson today. So he's a better driver. How many of y'all know I'm telling the truth? What I'm saying to you, he has 6,000 years of intensive study of the human psyche. He has 6,000 years. He knows your great-great-grandpa. He knows the anger he put in him, passed on to your great-great-grandpa, and to your grandpa, and to your dad. He knows that anger's in you. He knows when to tap it, how to tap it. And unless you lean on the man Christ Jesus, you cannot survive. Then he deceives you into thinking that Jesus is not able, that he can't keep you. The things you've committed unto him, he, he makes you think that God will not come through. I'm a living testimony this morning. Let me talk to you about my lungs. These lungs of mine that I preach with now for the past almost 40 or 50 minutes. Let me tell you about my, he makes you think he can't handle it. 1969, I'm laying up in the hospital, Kettering Hospital in Ohio. They've told me I've got bolus emphysema. They've told me the only way that I could make it and not be carrying oxygen around by the time I'm 40 is to stop preaching. <laughs> stop preaching. I'm called to preach. Preaching is all I do. Preaching is who I am. Don't tell me it's like cutting me off. Don't tell me I can't preach. Got to give it up. Only been preaching for five years at that time. Got to give it up. Find something else to do, he said. He said, do you have any other degrees? Yes. Besides preaching? Yes. Got a degree in New Testament. <laughs> Got a specialty in Hebrew and Greek. I'm a... I'm <laughs> Sam, I was in bad shape. You got, I, I, I got a master's in systematic theology. He said, the doctor said, well, you can't do nothing, can you? <laughs> Five years. My mind said, the Lord, listen to me. I'm talking about deception. The Lord would not call. You got to believe in Jesus. The Lord would not call a man to preach five years. I said, this is not my problem. This is God's problem. You got a problem you can't solve? Put it back in his lap. There is no temptation taking you, but those common to man. God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to have a problem bigger than you can handle, but will in the midst of your problem make a way of escape that you can bear. So when they test my lungs now, I have more lung power than you have with only one lung working fully. Somebody say he's able. Somebody say he's able. He does not bring you a test. He is not deceived in a way you cannot see through. Trust the God of heaven. He kicked him out once. He will kick him out forever. One day there will be a world where war, where war will not be studied. Where crime will be no more. Where the saints of God will stand on the sea of glass. I've been there in my mind. I believe him. I trust God. The war winner will win the war forever. And we shall be victorious with him. Give God the praise. Give God the glory. He's able. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Pass me not, O gentle Savior.
hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling do not pass me by I said your heads are bowed balcony your heads are bowed over here to my right your heads are bowed you're focusing on the war you're focusing on the war I want you to think about yourself right now How did it go this week? I've got to ask it again. Well, Pastor Wright, Pastor Thomas, I lost some battles. But you see, I didn't ask you how the battles went. I said, how'd the war go? Folk, you can lose battles and still win the war. That's all I'm saying to you. Don't get hung up on a failure you had this week. I had one too. Maybe I had more than one. Ain't none of your business. <laughs> See, the war, folk, victory in the war is guaranteed. So don't worry about a battle you lost. Lost my temper, okay. Lost my cool, okay. Lost my focus, okay. That's a battle. But hang in on the war. It's been won at the cross. A fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. The great controversy includes you in the ultimate victory. So here we are. Pastor Wright, Pastor Thomas, I'm, I'm glad I was here today. I needed this word. I needed this word. And I'm going to leave here today determined woo, to stand with the sword of the word in my hand, the helmet of salvation on my head, the breastplate of faith, my feet shod with the gospel of peace. I'm going to stand. Because the day I receive courage, as I listen to this word from this pitiful preacher, I receive courage. And you are thankful. My first appeal is very simple. You're just thankful that you heard this message. In fact, as you sat there, you said, this is exactly the message I needed to hear today. If you're thankful for that, just stand on your feet right now. Wherever you are, just stand. Second appeal. I'm wrestling with something in myself where I've been deceived. Second appeal, I'm wrestling with something in myself where I've let myself be deceived. And the sermon has given me determination not to keep lying to myself, but I need prayer. I need prayer. Pastor Wright, Pastor Thomas, I need prayer. If that's you, and there's a situation, and you want out, but you're not sure you need prayer. If that's your need, you're going to leave where you are and come down here right now, because I'm going to pray for you. Who's here? Who's here? I see you moving already. Balcony's not too far to come. Come on. Come on. Nobody's business why you're coming, but you're coming. Pastor, would you come and stand beside me, please? Come on, come on. Choir, help me with that song now. I need the choir singing. Hear my, hear my, humble. Come on, saints, help the choir. Wow, oh, I love it. Wow.
singing, just the piano. Final appeal. Today you want to make Jesus your savior. Maybe you've been taking Bible studies, been visiting this wonderful congregation. Or you used to be a part of the household of faith, drifted away. Now what I'm going to ask is going to take some courage. So today you're coming forward. Bible study, maybe even baptism, maybe even rebaptism. You're coming forward for that. You're going to come and you're going to stand right on this stage behind me. Oh, Pastor, don't do that to me. You're going to come, you're going to stand right on this stage behind me. Brother Penny will receive you. Is there someone who will make that decision today to join the church, to take Bible studies, to prepare for baptism? While you're making that decision, let's sing. Thou the spring of all my comfort. Everybody singing? Come on now. Yes. The spring. Come. More than life to be. Who am I? Who am I? Everybody singing together. now those especially who came forward you still can move up here behind us if you want to make that ultimate decision today or if you don't have the courage to come on the stage let the pastor know before you leave I today want to be a part of this I today want to start fresh pastor before we pray there's one who has come forward today that has been diagnosed with cancer. And they stand here with us mm. asking God to do something special yes. with their lives. So we're going to have two phases to this prayer. 
First, we're going to pray for those who have come forward. You've come because of your mm, mm, need of Jesus. That's you, a generic need. Mm. We all need the Lord. Am I right about it? We all need him. But then some of us need high doses. Mm. Because high doses are required when an individual needs divine intervention when they're in crisis mode. Lord help us. Lord help us. Father in heaven. There is a war. Mm. But we're grateful today in Jesus' name that our Savior is the victor. We're grateful today that he conquered the devil at the cross. Although he's not destroyed, he has placed him under the confines of the limits that are yours alone in your divine prerogative. We look forward to the day when he will be Destroyed. We look forward to the day when he'll be chained. We look forward to the day when the deceptions will cease mm. and truth will prevail. Thank we you. look forward to the day when war will be no more. We look forward to the day when sickness will be no more. We look forward to the day when temptation will be no more. We look forward to that day, but until that time, the battle wages on. And while it is waging, Lord, while we are engaged in it, while the clashing of arms is, mm. is going on in the unseen world, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Lord, we can't see the battle that is raging over mm. our, our souls. Praise Lord, help us to be respectful to you for what our lives cost. Mm. Help us, God, to recognize that Jesus not only had to die for our sins, but the battle continues to keep us, to protect us, to save us. All of that, oh God, is invested. Heaven invests all of its military hardware in the salvation of one soul. Lord, I pray that you would help us to appreciate what is costing for us to be saved. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the angels that are placed by our side that keep us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that anoints us. Thank you for scripture that teaches us and guides us. Thank you for your all-seeing eye that runs to and fro on the earth that we can never be outside of your protective vision. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you that we are special to you because we've claimed your son, the first begotten of the dead, as our Savior. Now, Lord, we pray for this young woman. Mm. She's come. She's come today. And she's asking us, oh God, to pray for her. Now, Lord. Mm. I've got to be real. There ain't no power in Elder Wright and I. We only hear as Amen. conduits of Amen. the Holy Ghost. Amen. You said that if there are any sick among you, let him call for the elders. Let him seek, let her seek the intervention of the divine care that comes through those that you have set aside, that you have anointed and appointed to be spokespersons for you. So Lord, Elder Wright and I are just standing here and we're touching and agreeing that you would do a miraculous thing on this young lady. Please. Father, she's at the prime Please. of her life. Please. Please. She is a special young lady. She has children. So she's not just an English, she's a mother. So Lord, we know that you understand how this works because you have seen too many times where the, the causes, of, where, where, the, where the results of sin 
have come into our lives, into our minds, into our bodies, and have deformed the image that you have placed in us. Lord, have mercy upon us. We live on a planet that is wrecked with disease and sickness, and Lord, you are our only source. Oh, we know there are great hospitals and there are great clinics and there are great physicians, but Lord, we're wanting to connect today to the greatest of all physicians. Jesus, please. Jesus, please. Father, Jesus. we are praying to you today. Now, there's a part of that passage in James chapter 5. We want to add that to this. Said that if there are sins, there will be they will be forgiven. Yes. Lord, we often forget that part. Because we are born in sin, we have to acknowledge we need you, Jesus. And we ask you, oh God, that as we're praying, that she will pray. Yes. And Lord, if there's something in our life that she needs to put aside, something in our life that she needs to dismiss, something in our heart that she needs to let go, something in her thoughts that she needs to release, something in her behavior that she needs to surrender. Father, we ask that you would take control of her thoughts and her, her thinking right now and open her heart to the Holy Spirit that she will pray right now and say, Father, I confess it. I claim it in the name of Jesus. Cleanse me from all sin and all unrighteousness. And Lord, you have a promise. It's a passage that says you'll cast it into the sea of forgiveness and you won't bring it up against us again. Father, we want to ask that she will be cleansed now. And I'm praying that she will pray. Lord, we pray and she is praying. And so, Lord, I pray that Elder Wright will conclude this prayer of a special intercession and anointing of this young lady. Lord, he knows what it's like to, to carry a disease. He knows what it's like to fight an illness. He knows what it's like. So Father, I ask that he would conclude this prayer in Jesus' name. Father God, you who are the author of the human body, you who, when this girl was born, knew this day would come. And have prepared for her a deliverance she cannot even imagine. First, deliverance from self and from sin. Secondly, deliverance from fear and doubt. You allow nothing to destroy us. You only allow that that will save us. Yes. And that prayer and that appeal and instruction in James 5 says that you will, first of all, before you heal us, you will save us. Yes. So the prayer for healing is a salvation prayer. Yes. Save her from herself. Yes. God. Then there's nothing in her body that can do her any eternal harm. Yes. Because you've saved her from her sin. Yes. May her hand of faith reach out now and touch God. Yes, God. May she know that you've allowed this, that she might be not just physically healed, yes. but spiritually, morally, mentally, and socially, and financially healed. This is not just a prayer from disease of the body, but from yes. disease of sin and life. Yes. Deliver her, we pray. Yes. We claim that. I know what you can do. Yes. I know why you let disease come. It's to humble is to make us dependent and trust you. I know what it is to live that life of dependence. Afraid to open my mouth and preach, but know that you'll take my lungs every time and yes. preach through them. I know what you can do. Yes. Let her know yes. what you can do. Yes. Only you. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Oh, God. And we claim it now. Yes. In the name of the Father. Yes. The Son. Yes. And the Holy Spirit. Amen. And all of God's children said amen. 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 Let's return to our seats reverently, quietly. When we have spiritual moments like this, the worst thing we can do to the work of the Holy Spirit is to become frivolous trivial in our conversations so we're going to sing the hymn final hymn and we're going to give you two announcements here they are please listen to them carefully there is a light lunch prepared for you downstairs 
we ask that you would respect the environment it has been prepared for Vacation Bible School. So when you go downstairs, if you have small children, keep them close to you. There are many things you will see there, and they are set up for Vacation Bible School that begins July the 25th, 25th pardon me. The second announcement is this. Elder Wright is preaching again at 6 o'clock. What time did I say? Okay. He and his wife are going to go out that door into my office, and we're taking them off site so that they can have a relaxing time. There are only four hours, four hours and ten minutes between now and six o'clock. He needs that time. You will grant him that time. Amen? Amen. And so we're going to slip away. And then at the end of the service this evening at six o'clock, he will have the opportunity to meet and greet as his strength allows. We have a closing hymn. I know we do. So let's all stand. Let's sing that closing him as we are directed okay and as we have sung the last stanza consider yourselves dismissed and Ella Penny has charge of the service when we all get to heaven found on the screen and on in your hymn book 633 we'll sing the first and the last verses. again for this informative and spiritual day we've had here. We pray now that as we leave this place, let us never leave your presence. Stay with us, be with us, keep us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, meditate for a moment, and you'll be dismissed.